All right, guys, a little tired here. Sorry, it's been kind of a long day. So we're going to quickly go over the Enlightenment and the American Revolution. Uh, so the, Re the Revolutions Unit, so a little bit of background, comes from here in the Enlightenment. And the political ideas of the Enlightenment are going to come right out of the scientific revolution where Jedi thinkers like Nicholas Copernicus will bring about a new way of looking at the physical world. It was thought that if reason can be used to govern the physical world, then reason could be also applied to understanding natural laws. And by natural laws, people meant that they are the laws that govern the basics of human nature. Right? Science and reason, we can figure out. These are questions that like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle were thinking about way back in classical Greece. Natural laws govern the basics of human nature. And so it is then, you know, thereby stood, it stands to reason, that if natural laws were applied to society, we could diagnose and we could figure out the causes of the problems and the cures for many social, economic, and political wrongdoings to solve the social, the political, and economic turmoil of the day. And the big problem is we have the transatlantic trade, the Colombian exchange, all that wealth is extracted from the Americas, it's brought over to Europe and we had the age of absolutism of Louis XIV and the Stuart dynasty in England and Peter the Great and Habsburgs and in China the Ming dynasty, Tokugawa Yasu in Japan and all that good stuff. But guys began to think, is this the best way to do things? And this pits two guys, one Thomas Hobbes and one John Locke against each other. And during the reign of the Stuart dynasty in England, John Locke and Thomas Hobbes are two guys who will both live through the English Civil War. The Cavaliers and the Roundheads, Oliver Cromwell and all that. And the two guys come up with two different thoughts on what we call the social contract. The first guy, you should remember from uh, civics and economics here. Um, and that is John Locke. John Locke is a philosopher who felt that people at their core are basically good and moral. And according to Locke, they were also entitled to what he calls natural rights. Things that every individual has from the time they were born. And Locke believed that everybody had the right to three things, life, liberty, and property. You had the right to your life as your own. You had the right to have liberty to make your own choices and to own property. You were not property of others. You could own property, land, a house, a business, practical things. So I like to say John Locke unlocks the freedom of life, liberty, and property. Locke also believed that governments should be specifically formed to protect these natural rights. It is the job of the government to protect your life, your liberty, and your property. And the best form of government has to be one of limited power. You couldn't have an absolute monarch like Louis XIV or Peter the Great running around. According to Locke, the monarchs of his time were incorrect. The government has an obligation to its citizens. The government is obligated to what its citizens need. And if a government failed to live up to those obligations, then it was the people's right to overthrow that government and create a new one. Thomas Jefferson will say the same thing. Listen to that. It is the Government's obligation to protect those rights, obligated to its citizens. And if a government fails that right to respect a person's basic rights, then it's not the people's right. It is their duty to
to overthrow it and create a new one, to have a revolution. Fellow English philosopher Thomas Hobbes has an opposite view, a diametrically opposite view of John Locke. Um, it was a much darker view of human nature. In his book that he calls Leviathan, all right, whoops, um, who did I do? Did I do Hobbes first? Okay, Thomas Hobbes here writes this book, I got him backwards, called Leviathan, where he says that people at their nature are greedy and selfish. And therefore, since people are greedy and selfish, they need a strong government to control them, to tell them what to do. According to Hobbes, everybody lived in what was called a state of nature. Our basic bare instincts. And in this state of nature, um, people were uncontrolled. In what he would call people's lives are nasty, poor, brutish, and short. Right? You're going to have a poor life, you're going to have a nasty, brutish existence, and then you are going to die young. So in order to prevent this, what needs to happen is to be created what is called a social contract, where people would willingly give up their state of nature. They would give up that disorganized, um, greedy, selfish nature, and have a government that would organize that. This government must be powerful to make the people do what is necessary. You can't just do what you want. You've got to do what's for the good of society. So Hobbes, the best form of government is an absolute government. So I like to say Hobbes hogged all the power, and Locke will unlock the freedom. As I say, uh-oh, the American Revolution is on the way here. Now, adding on to the, these two English philosophers is this guy, the Baron de Montesquieu, a French political thinker. And think of his name. He has three names, Baron of Montesquieu, Baron de Montesquieu. Well, the Baron had studied all forms of government from ancient to modern, from Egyptian pharaohs to Platonic Greece, you know it. And much like John Locke, Montesquieu does not like the idea of an absolute monarch. In his essay, The Spirit of the Laws, Montesquieu, a Frenchman, gives credit to the British. What they are doing there, and this is a very powerful thing, the English and French hate each other. But Montesquieu says the British and their idea of a limited monarchy, that is exactly what we need. And he liked how the British implemented what he considered to be three separate branches. The executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branches. So the prime minister, parliament, and the court system. To Montesquieu, you must have a separation of powers. It is the only way to maintain liberty where three, an uneven number of objects can check and balance each other. Now, as you all know from your civics and economics, we use Montague's system in the United States today where no one branch can be more powerful than the others. And the next guy is real tough. Francois-Marie Aroux, better known under his pen name or pseudonym Voltaire. Voltaire says something really difficult for people to get, especially in the modern day. Voltaire famously says that he lived to say what he thought. You know, be careful if you ask me my opinion, because he was going to tell it to you. And he's an extremely controversial figure in France. And since he knew he was controversial, he kind of uses a combination of comedy and fiction and cleverness to express his ideas about the problems of the time. In his famous work, Candide, Voltaire will speak out and publicly denounce governmental corruption. 
He hates the practice of the slave trade. And he hated religious exclusivity. He said, you shouldn't just have to be Catholic. You can be Protestant. You can be Jew. It really doesn't matter. But his ideas in his book will anger the Roman Catholic Church. And it makes its ripples effects all the way up into the French governmental circles. These are royals. These are nobles. Who is this guy? Voltaire was exiled. They kick him out. But this only makes him matter. And they burn many of his books, which only made some people want to read them more. So he keeps going. And Voltaire says this thing, I believe in free speech so much that I will defend it no matter how I'm punished. He famously says, I may not agree with what you are saying, but I will defend your right to say it to my death even if your opinion is completely opposite of mine. If you are Donald Trump and I am Nancy Pelosi, then I will listen to your opinion and must go vice versa. I may disagree with what you say, but defend your right to say it to my death. He was dedicated to defending true free speech, something that is becoming more and more and more difficult in today's world. So we're pushing the envelope. We don't like absolute government if we're unlocking the freedom. We do with we're Hobbes. But a guy living in that system says, ah, Voltaire says, I don't know. And then the Montesquieu, Baron de Montesquieu says we've got to have three branches. And this brings us next. Um, here are the um, three guys. Here is clearly um, Thomas Hobbes. Uh, this here is my boy, um, John Locke. Over here is going to be the next guy, the Baron de Montesquieu. And here is um, Voltaire. So anyway, um, next guy up is Dennis Diderot. And Diderot, um, I think, what did Dennis write? Dennis Diderot publishes a set of encyclopedias, a 28-volume set. And in these encyclopedias, he prints all the works of political philosophers like Voltaire and Montesquieu, Locke and Hobbes. He prints everything and says, it's your job to figure it out. Diderot said his goal was to change the way that people thought about their government. And Diderot's encyclopedias challenge their prevailing theory of divine right, like you are in charge because God put you here. He says, ah, I don't really know about that. He doesn't like divine right, and he doesn't like absolute monarchy. The French government accused Diderot of eroding the morals of the people of France. The Pope threatens to excommunicate him. Anybody caught reading his encyclopedias could be kicked out of the church. However, no matter how hard they tried to stop the people from reading these encyclopedias, 20,000 were printed. The more they tried to cut it off, the more people wanted to read them. People read about these, the idea <coughs> excuse me, of the Enlightenment not only in Europe, but also across the sea in the Americas as well. Which brings us to our last stop here. French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And he, like Montesquieu, is a French philosopher who thought a lot of John Locke. He says, basically, at our essence, people are good. And if you remember this, this is exactly the debate between, like, you know, Plato and Aristotle. People are good, however, they are constantly being corrupted by society. So in 1762, Rousseau writes his own version of the social contract. He said, men are born free. We are free. But it is society that constantly changes us from good to bad. 
Look at you guys, you're oversensitized by social media and Instagram and Snapchat. And now we have reality stars who are famous for doing nothing or being skanky in a video. Why are they the social icons? What have they done? What was their contributions to society? But you're bombarded with it. Video games and cell phones and internet. Oh, these are what the cool kids are doing, vaping in the boys room like Motley Crue back in 1984. So you start out good, but little by little by little, you get corrupted. Rousseau says that society controls the way people are shaped and behave. You don't really know it, it's just the way it is because it's what everybody does. But Rousseau says that some social controls are necessary. We've got to have organization, we've got to have order, we can't have anarchy. So he said a consenting form of government that the people, this is important, that the people themselves choose is what is important. It is what is necessary for the common good. Otherwise, people would surrender their rights. You can't have anarchy. When governed in a system that was based on their consent, people retain their freedoms. The majority of these freedoms because the government was chosen based on the will of the majority of the people. Right? You're never going to be able to please everybody. So the majority of the people feel this way, so that's what we are going to do. It's Aristotle all over again. Now he says, common good should win. So unlike John Locke, Rousseau felt that one individual or felt that an individual, one person, should aim for the good of the community rather than the good of the individual. I don't really know about that one. All right? It's got to be a combination of the two. All right? You should aim for the good of the community rather than for the good of the individual. So Rousseau is like Plato. Give yourself over to the will of the um, community. Now, we've talked a lot here about men, so we've got to talk about women as well. To um, many people, um, the free and equal ideas of the Enlightenment did not apply to women. Many felt that women did not have natural rights, or if they did, they were much more limited in scope than those of men. So in the 1750s, a small number of women began to argue against this idea. The most famous of which is a lady named Mary Wollstonecraft. It's W-O-L-L-S-T-O-N-E-C-R-A-F-T. She was from England, and she protested that women had been left out of the social contract. She felt that a woman should first and foremost be a good mother to her children. That's job number one. However, a woman should also be able to think for herself and not be solely dependent on her husband. She wrote The Vindication of the Rights of a Woman. The Vindication of the Rights of a Woman. Woman. In which she claimed that the same education that was given to a boy should be given to a girl, because education was a path to freedom and independence. With knowledge, you can think and do things on your own. we got two other things to quickly talk about here real fast, and that is a new economic thought known as laissez-faire, a French term. Scientific thought that gave rise to the idea of a person's natural rights and the best form of government will bring about new forms of economic thought as well. And one of these ideas is laissez-faire, meaning that business and economic enterprise should be allowed to operate without any government interference, or the government telling you what you cannot do. Now these new ideas are completely opposite of those of mercantilism where you make money for the good of the mother country. European economies were running on mercantilism at this time. Under that system, 
European economies were measuring their wealth against each other's accumulation of precious metals, gold and silver. Enlightenment philosophers, however, will say that one should make land as productive as possible. It's not mineral wealth, it's land wealth. New wealth would be determined by farming and logging, things like tobacco and sugar cane and lumber and rice. So there should be free trade in these areas. You could do whatever you want and not be restricted to the isolationist idea of trading with the mother country. Right, where you can only trade with one other, your mother country. Philosophers of the Enlightenment want to open up the colonies and let them buy, sell, and trade with each other in order to make money. So it's in 1776, a true Jedi, Adam Smith, writes The Wealth of Nations, in which he describes what he calls a free market system. In a free market system, a national economy would be subjected to the forces of supply and demand. If a manufacturer supplies a product and people want it, they will eventually meet at a price where people are going to buy enough of it to make the supplier rich and to make the supplier make more. Supply and demand will regulate business activity. Everything, according to Smith, is tied together from the manufacturing of products to the amount of money an employee can be paid, to the level of profit the owner makes. You will arrive at a sweet spot where all those things jive. If there was demand for a product, the demand would be met. And it happens better in an economy when the government isn't interfering and telling you what to do. To Smith, the government's job was to focus on ensuring justice and protecting its people not interfering with the economy. As the Industrial Revolution grows and spreads, Smith's ideas shape the world up until the current day. And so across Europe, people began to discuss these new social, political, and economic ideas. The old monarchies were being assaulted as people were seeking the best social and economic well-being for themselves. In Voltaire's Candide, a traveler will literally travel the world, kind of like Plato, looking for the best possible society. But while people are discussing different national governments, the Roman Catholic Church is trying to hold on to power. The more that, that people engaged in thought and questioning, the less power they had. In the United States, people were beginning to assemble all parts of the Enlightenment. Political, economic, social ideas that had been championed by men like Locke and Montesquieu and Smith. These ideas will be seen in the United States Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So the Enlightenment, which happens in Europe, will reach fruition in the United States. It will reverberate back to Europe and then come down to, the Amer to South um, America in the upcoming revolutions. So very, very, very quickly, we are going to go over the American Revolution. We are um, going to do this real fast with some picture slides here as to what goes on. Um, during the 17 and 1800s, European monarchs went on a quest to find these new avenues of money. This is the colonization of the Americas. And one reason was the large amount of money that European countries spent fighting each other, like England and France and the French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War. Another reason was for the desire of European rulers to become absolute, like Louis XIV, Charles V. In pursuing these desires, they not only destabilized their own countries, but they upset their colonies in the Americas. 
So between 1775 and 1825, 1775 and 1825, several revolutions will occur throughout the European colonies overseas. As a result, North America and South America are going to reshape the political outlook of the entire world. And it starts here in Boston. No taxation without representation. When the French and Indian War ends in 1763, tensions between the colonies in America and England were very high. The war drained King George III of his treasury. He wanted his money. Parliament and King George felt that the colonies should pay for the war, since after all, it was fought to protect them. Thus, Parliament and the King began to enforce long forgotten trade laws, and Parliament raised taxes on the colonists, but not at home. And the saying was no taxation without representation. According to the English Bill of Rights, you know, the people have to agree to this tax increase. So if the King George would have allowed an American representative of Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson to sit in Parliament, not a problem would be had. Some of these guys were rich. They could afford the taxes. The problem was they weren't asked. And the king said, if I raise taxes at home, my people will bellyache. But 3,000 miles away, I don't care how loud they cry because I can't hear it from my house. So in the 13 colonies, people were angry. They had worked very hard to become self-sufficient. Let's be honest, the British government didn't help them all that much. So if their taxes were going to be raised, then give us representation in London. No taxation without representation. Well, in 1770, after throwing some snowballs at frightened British soldiers, the British soldiers panicked. You can watch the miniseries here on John Adams. And some of the soldiers, which is a bad idea, are going to fire into and kill civilians in the crowd. One of them was an African-American man named Chris Bizzatix, a former runaway slave. It happened right out here outside the old state house, um, now known as the site of the Boston Massacre. So in response to that, in the old South Meeting House, Colonists, led by Sam Adams in 1773, snuck down on the wharves and threw about a million dollars or so of British tea overboard disguised as Mohawk Indians, the famous Boston Tea Party. And so it is after this that the leaders, here's some of the actual tea from the Boston Tea Party, I always get a big kick out of that, seeing that. Um, right around here is where the T, you can see like Declan Military Reed running around there if you look real close. I don't know. So the First Continental Congress is going to be held. Leaders from the colonies met in 1774 to figure out what to do next. And these are the varsity guys. John Adams is there, and Ben Franklin is there, and Thomas Jefferson. And these are the guys who become known as the Founding Fathers. While I know they were far from perfect, it was like being in Renaissance Florence, one of the most brilliant minds in history are together in one spot, and they create a modern working government that is able to expand with time and power. And these Jedi discuss the relationship of the colonies with England. And they will create the Continental Army, and they will appoint one of their members, General George Washington, as the general of the army. So, in June of 1775, they will meet again in Philadelphia at the Second Continental Congress. And by June, the fighting against England had begun. It was around this time of year, April 18th and 19th, that Paul Revere and Dr. Samuel Prescott and the other guys went on their famous ride, and the battles of Lexington and Concord were fought. Um, Second Continental Congress approves these things. There is one of the lanterns, you know, one if by land, two if by sea. Got a big kick out of that. And early on, the war it goes badly, um, as the Continental Congress had few funds. They had no money, they've got no military um, supplies or abilities. 
The British Army was the biggest power on the earth. There's no way these stupid American colonists are going to be able to upset them. The most professional and feared army in the world was the British. So among the members of the Second Continental Congress were the influential writers of the Declaration, John Adams, Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and in 1776, the Congress votes on the approval of the Declaration. The document articulates many of the ideas set forth by John Locke. And so, off these guys go. The philosophies were interwoven with the Americans' ideals or reasons for declaring independence. And the Declaration is considered one of the greatest documents in all of human history. So heading into the revolution, as I'm standing here in Lexington, England's got a lot of advantages. Number one, they've got this large professional army. Number two, they've got enormous resources, colonies around the world to draw on, and many people in the Americas were still loyal to England. So the 13 colonies of the new United States had volunteer citizens, soldiers, not professionals, not redcoats, no navy to speak of, and no money or other resources which to fall back on, just pioneering um, you know, guys like John Parker here in Lexington. They were going to go out, and the only citizen or um, uh, advantage they had, they were fighting on home ground, like these fine Americans here on Lexington Green. And they, you know, they had cities like Boston and New York and Philadelphia are going to be occupied, so they move into the countryside. Well, during the early years, we all know things look hopeless. Then on Christmas night in 1776, George Washington leads the army across the Delaware River, and they win the Battle of Trenton in New Jersey and Princeton. Morale grows. But then is the terrible winter of 1777-1778 when the army spent at um, Valley Forge. But through that winter they were trained by a guy named Baron Manfred von Steuben, a Prussian. And when the Continental Army goes up against the British in the spring, they now have the training to stand up to the British veterans. And the American victories will embolden our French allies. If you look in my back corner over here, you see the French coming to help out. They recognize the colonies enjoying an alliance against their old enemy, Great Britain. With the French, we get money, supplies, soldiers, and most importantly, a navy. 1781, the French fleet is going to blockade Chesapeake Bay. These Americans are firing on the British all the way back. Um, all the way to Boston, Joseph Warren, Bunker Hill. And here we are um, at Yorktown. 1781, Washington boxes in British Lord Cornwallis in the Virginia city of Yorktown. And when the British surrender, it signals the collapse of the British war effort in the New World. Two years later, the Treaty of Paris is signed by England, recognizing the existence of the United States of America. The American Revolutionary War ends with the United States becoming a permanent country. And then we struggle, all right, with things known as the Articles of the Confederation, which are terrible. They function very weak, and they don't really work. So in the hot summer of 1787, the current United States Constitution was written. The Constitution framed out a strong federal government at the central level that had the ability to grow and flex and change with the time. This also creates a legislature that's going to have two houses, an upper house called the Senate, in which every state receives two votes, and a lower house called the House of Representatives that's determined by population for a grand total of 435 people. The leader of the United States is going to be a president 
who would lead a federal republic, taking ideas from Greece and Rome, and to balance this out would be a nine-member Supreme Court. So in total, there will be three branches of government, an executive, a legislative, and a judicial, to check and balance each other so no one group can take over. The document was strong and adaptable, which is its genius. It becomes a living document that can grow and change with the times. Here we are, hundreds of years later, and it's changed 27 times. Drawing its ideas from men like John Locke and Baron de Montesquieu. The United States becomes a federal republic in 1789. The new government was a representative government was run by an elected legislature where the people vote. But to be one of those people who vote, you've got to be a free white man, African Americans, Native Americans, and women, sorry Mary Wollstonecraft, are still not able to vote. However, at this point is the freest government the world had seen since Rome. Also being written at the time um, were the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights contained the first ten amendments to the United States Constitution. It spells out people's basic rights, such as freedom of religion, freedom of the press, Voltaire's freedom of speech, and many other ideas that are traced back to the Enlightenment. This is the longest one, guys, but we got to make time due to all that missed weather. American Revolution Enlightenment, I'll see you tomorrow.